I want to start us off with your observations on sort of what is the scene today, what you are seeing today. Assalamu alaikum and good morning to everyone. Um, the topic of women in tech comes up quite a lot, especially with regards to representation. Uh, but more importantly, there's a vital driver towards having women both in technology but also in science. Scientific discovery and technological advancement today is deeply rooted in every facet of our existence as humanity. It gives us the cures to diseases. It provides the potential for growth. It gives us solutions to challenges across the globe. Those solutions need to be tackled by everyone. Diversity then becomes key to the advancement of science and technology. And it's not only gender diversity, but diversity across the board, because you need diversity in perspective. If we go back to the scientific method, it starts with questions. It starts with questioning the norm, with observations. Those are enriched by differences in perspectives. And those are enriched by the values that we all carry, and those are enriched by the journeys that we all take as individuals. And it's the diversity in that thought process and that triggering initial thought process that brings about results. If I go deeply into technology and the advancement of technology across sectors, especially in a field where computers are starting to think and give us solutions and give us recommendations, it is this thought process that needs to be built in into solutions across the board and across sectors that needs to be done correctly. If the data that is fed in, the analytics that are taken forward, the algorithms that are brought forward are not done with, with a lens into removing biasness, those systems will be created with the exact same biases that the Honorable Prime Minister spoke about earlier and that we all speak about having those challenges. And then it becomes inevitable to not only tackle diversity in STEM, and diversity in technology, but also tackle diversity um, in women in technology, especially in the forefront of technological advancement and rollout. Sarah? I mean, she said it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, I think to pick up on, on sort of algorithms and, and, and diversity as a whole and sort of the representation of it. You know, I always say, and I, I work in the space of artificial intelligence and always say that an AI is only as good as the HI behind it, um, which is the human intelligence. Um, you know, all these models need to be trained. Um, and if the AI does not represent the world that it is modeling, then you will have a highly biased AI. So when we talk about AI doctors today, I always say a lot of these doctors are going to be doctors that are good at treating 27 to 35 year old white men unless we fix the teams that are designing these. And, and, and sort of the role of sort of diversity in this is, is, is multifaceted. It's in, it's in gender, it's in race, it's in nationality, it's in backgrounds. It's actually a lot broader than even the ways in which we have defined diversity. And so as, as, you, know, as you talk about sort of the role that government can play, you know, to me, it's in redefining what diversity means. I think we still have a very, very shallow um, definition of it, and it's one that we need to broaden, and we need to systematically broaden to make sure that we're really thinking of all the facets. So you mentioned some of the barriers, you know, whether it's bias, whether it's our understanding that, you know, um, diversity is, is more than what it's perceived. So I would like you to touch on each in your opinions of what are still barriers that are still persisting uh, today? So I'll talk perhaps about technology and um, technological development and more importantly of women in business and women as entrepreneurs. Um, entrepreneurship and the creation of businesses is deeply rooted in existing networks, especially if you're talking about finding financial support uh, finding the necessary support and know-how and capabilities. It is based entirely on networks. And as you spoke, those networks are shaped by a particular group around the world, just by, by virtue of, not design, but by virtue of the way that it has evolved over time and by virtue of it extracting a lot of cultural norms um, over the course of the last few decades. And 
That I would call as the first uh, barrier. The second is the leaky pipeline that exists in science, and that's more in the scientific research realm. We do see, and even here in the UAE, uh, we've reached almost gender parity of women entering into STEM fields and graduating in STEM fields. Uh, but the leaky pipeline exists later on. So 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And those are the designers that Sarah spoke about. Those are the designers that design the, the questions that go into it and the, um, the directions of research and the mechanisms of development. If we don't empower um, more and more diversity, and I really love what you mentioned. Yes, I completely agree. We have not defined diversity. And we see, uh, see that more and more evident. If you want to know what the litmus test uh, for how open we are as a global society, check what's happening in the world today. Check what was happening in the world a year ago. There is a stratification that exists. There is a, an underlying bias that is being vocalized at this time. And that is a big hindrance that carries on to all sectors, but it will amplify even more when it carries on to science and tech because of the earlier comment that I make, because it's part of our daily lives, whether we like it or not, whether we accept it or not, science and technology is one of the key drivers of economic and societal development today, and it will continue to be down the line. Yeah, um, I'll talk about the barrier of funding because at the end of the day, um, innovation in, in both science and technology requires funding, whether it's in academic research or it's in the field of business. Um, and, you know, I always say that I, in my past life, before I started my, my company, Grow Intelligence, I used to be an oil and gas trader. And I was the first of many in that world. I've never felt more of the first of any than actually when I entered the field of technology and decided to start a, a, an AI company, which is that, and it shouldn't be, because I feel like my, what we've accomplished as a company are still tiny relative to the vision and the ambition that we have. And so how do we think about financing when so much about how we finance, um, whether it's, again, it's companies or projects or research, is based on pattern recognition. And if, you don't fit the pattern, then the money doesn't flow your way. So how do you break that cycle of pattern recognition? One of my favorite investors is actually somebody who turned me down. And the reason he became one of my favorites is that he called me to say, I'm gonna turn down this opportunity to invest in you because I am very good at what I do because I recognize patterns. And you do not fit a pattern that I know. I started a company in Kenya, and it went global. We're based in New York, Kenya, and Singapore. Now we're actually opening offices here. But it's, I didn't fit that pattern. I didn't fit the pattern of somebody who came out of a technical field. I used to trade natural gas and oil and then decided to start a technology company in agriculture. Um, and I, we didn't have a business model that met, met a pattern that he understood. But the reason he became one of my favorites is he told me the truth, which most people don't. Mm -hmm. But that unleashed in me a thought process around how do we break the pattern recognition that is necessary mm -hmm. because of, you know, to me, funding is a huge barrier. At the end of the day, you need money for, for all of this. And so thinking about that is, is gonna be critical. And I think, Sarah, as well, in particular, since you're working with AI, a lot of the predictive models that you work with are based on on these standards that, that the industry has and other programmers are, are setting for you as a result. Um, my next question is, is, has COVID helped or impacted it negatively or, pos uh, or, or, or uh, positively in your opinion? You know, I think it hasn't really had as much an impact on us um, as a company. I think in the technology industry as a whole, whole, it's had a net positive effect because of the idea of a distributed workforce actually becoming more common, right? So you become more open to hiring team members that are not in your same city, that are not in the same country even, and, and that becoming semi-permanent in the way in which we're operating, you know, businesses and, 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 and organizations as a whole, I think is net positive. You know, for me, because we were so resource constrained in the, in the early days, I, I always tell our team, you know, we work in food security and climate change. That's all we do. 
And I always say we work, went from working on obscure problems to obvious challenges over the next, last eight years. When I started the company eight years ago, nobody understood why I would leave the career that I had that was perfectly lucrative and a really easy life, frankly, <laughs> to go about this task. And, but because we were so resource constrained early on, I had to be very creative about the people we hired. And so actually we had a, t a team that really resembled the world we were modeling from day one. Um, and keeping it as we're growing really fast now. So it's one thing when you're, you know, 10 people, 20 people, even 50 or 100. But now when you're going into the multiple hundreds and we're over 200 now, it, it starts to get harder and harder to manage. Um, so how do you actually inculcate that? And how do you keep preserve that is the question I have. But I think for most organizations, they're just being introduced to that concept now. Agreed. Your Excellency, uh, I'll direct the same question to you, obviously from a from a regulator uh, perspective uh, in the UAE? In, in terms of support, I think one of the key aspects that we're looking into today is understanding where the challenges are. Because the challenges are not the same everywhere in the world. And considering the development pattern um, across industry and with the utilization of technology here, and actually the benefit of it being relatively nascent allows us to design the right programs for it. So we've started with uh, looking into roughly at, now we've targeted 180 SMEs to just understand the challenges, their mechanisms of adopting technology, their mechanisms of developing um, and advancing, not only to give them a roadmap towards the adoption of technology into their businesses, but more importantly, to give us an understanding on what our policies need to be, what our funding mechanisms need to be, how do we ensure diversity across the board, where do you need to create interventions? And I think that's very important because any form of copy-paste model, taking, for example, a program that supports uh, microloans for women in, in businesses, for example, in the US, will not, might not work here. Um, and it's that understanding that we're taking some time with so that we can understand the root cause of the issues uh, to be able to create the right in instrumentations and the right tools to do it. But another aspect that's very important, and I think some, it's something that's very important that has resonated globally, uh, is the existence of role models, because you need to have a continued pipeline across the board. And um, in a recent study, or recent survey by PwC, I think roughly 70% of people in universities weren't able to identify a woman in technology, mm -hmm. or a leader in technology around the world. And that's a key factor and a key challenge that also needs to be addressed to remove these psychological barriers to enter uh, into the fields of technology. So as policymakers, we need to better understand what tools need to be created from, from a governance perspective, what funding mechanisms need to be created. Sometimes it's, it's the access to know-how and experience and the creation and formalization of networks. And it's the mix of those that needs to be created across nations to be able to deploy them correctly to support women. You, meant, you, you touched upon and answered the question I had, Your Excellency, so I'll, I'll move on to the next one. Um, and I know we're short in time, so I want to give you guys the, the most time possible. With everything that, that was being said in the previous session and what you mentioned, in your opinion, what would the future of women in tech look like? Can I turn that into the future of diversity in tech? Because that's even more vital than tackling one prong of the problem. If we actively and consciously work towards understanding what biases exist in the systems, what gaps and deficiencies exist in the system, empowering individuals across the board, and I, I, I go back, big aha moment, at least for me, defining what diversity is and what it means for technology and what it means for, for, for um, the development and advancement of technology. If we're able to harness all, all of that, the future is quite positive for science and technology. If we drop the ball, anywhere, we will continue carrying on these biases and it's going to become more and more dangerous because it will be linked into the fabric of our decision-making processes, into the utilization of technology, into things that are meant to make our lives better and, and make our lives more productive and provide solutions to climate change, provide solutions to food security. It's detrimental because the aspects where technologies are today touching are vital to our daily lives. I know I've said this so many times, but this is, this is something that's very important for us to be aware of. 
um, and, and with it, we'll be able to advance into the brighter future that we can find with technology if we are aware of the internal biases that we all have and work towards solving them. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think the future depends on who we choose to highlight and who we choose to elevate um, and whose stories we tell. I think media and storytelling has a very big role to play in what the future actually looks like because of the way in which, again, we go out and find and identify sort of the, the stories to tell and the people to highlight. And I, you know, I watch my co-founder, who's another woman, and I see her 10-year-old daughter and her 10-year-old's daughter perception of what is possible and what she wants to do in the future is so different than what she and I ever had as 10-year-olds because we didn't have people to look up to to even say, I can, in, in, in the realm of what do you do in, in your life, she'll tell you she's gonna start a company. She started designing a business model at the age of eight just coming to our office because she's like, what do you guys do? And you know, she walks into a building and says, how do I buy this building? She doesn't even say, how do I rent an office in, in a building, <laughs> right? So I think it, it is that though, if we choose to, to sort of elevate and highlight and tell stories in ways that are representative of the world and a world that we want to see. I think there's so much of storytelling that's dystopic today in, in both fiction and, and nonfiction. The stories that sell tend to be the negative stories. How do we tell the positive stories? And how do we use those to elevate and move into a future we want to see, because I think you can manifest that. But there's a lot of work to be done there. Well, we stopped just as the, the timer stopped. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for, for your observations and insights. And thank you all for, for being here today. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.